It's a delight for Kitty and me to be here. Incidentally, although she's hobbling around with a busted ankle, she's still the best looking Medicare recipient in America, as I think you'll agree. <laughs> and, she's a, and, and she's about to celebrate her 76th birthday. Um, but um, why am I here? Well, because I have enormous respect for this guy, and in any event, he's Greek. I was about to start by saying, I have a you know, and so on and so forth, but you wouldn't know what I was talking about. There are some people here who know. Um, and I've been designated a keynote speaker. Now, that's a dangerous thing to do to a retired politician. I mean, you know, you may never get me off this platform. So I'm going to try to be reasonably brief. Um, I remember once, Dimitri, I was emceeing the ceremony at the end of the Greek Independence Day parade in Boston. And it was at that balcony in, on, on, in the Boston City Hall, you know, that, that thing that kind of overlooks the plaza. There were thousands of people there. And uh, they must have had eight scheduled speakers. And if you know anything about the Greeks, another 20 people came up to me saying, you know, just, I just want to talk. I mean, I'm, they all wanted to talk. So, so I really put the, and I finally turned to somebody next to me and I said, how do you say short and sweet in Greek? He said, liga kekala. Anyway, a few words and good ones, so I'll try to do that. But after all, I'm the keynote speaker, so I've got to talk about something. And what I want to talk about for a few brief minutes, I mean, you're going to be blessed with a panel with my dear friend and colleague, Barry Bluestone, who spent some time here before going to UMass Boston and is now gracious with his presence and his leadership and if you'll pardon the expression, the Dukakis Center at Northeast University. God, they start naming things for you folks, you know you're on your way out, so, uh, you know. <laughs> um, but this was to some extent triggered by Paul Krugman's column today in the New York Times. I hate the word entitlements. I don't know where it came from. It ought to be stripped from our vocabulary. Entitlements. What are these folks talking about? Got to do something about entitlements. Who was it? Eric Cantor the other day said, entitlement reform has got to be part of this grand bargain or whatever it is. This is Medicare and Social Security. This is the way we guarantee a very, very, very modest basic income for people in this country that have worked hard contributed handsomely to the system, or are chronically and severely disabled. That's what Social Security is, folks. And Medicare, fortunately for those of us 65 and older, although now they're talking about moving the age up, Medicare is the way we provide decent, comprehensive health care to people 65 and older and people who are chronically and severely disabled. And these are entitlements. I'm sorry, I don't like the term. This is social insurance. That's what it is. And, and it's the way we try to respond to the needs of those of us who either have severe and chronic disabilities or have worked hard, have contributed, by the way, through payroll taxes. You know this business about how 45, 47% of the country doesn't pay income taxes. They're paying income taxes, folks. Except we call it a pay payroll tax. And it's a very unfair and regressive income tax. Why? Well, for one thing, it doesn't apply to interest, dividends, and capital gains. And needless to say, the folks that make their money from those things tend to be, if not in the top 1%, in the top 5%. And secondly, it's capped at $116,000. So if you're a millionaire, you only pay a payroll tax on your first $116,000. Your effective rate is about one-tenth of the average Americans. And of course, you pay nothing on your income, which is reflected in dividends, interest, and capital gains. So the folks that are benefiting, if I may say, from Social Security and Medicare, not only are people who I think most Americans believe should have some basic 
income and health security in their golden years, but have contributed in a way which is disproportionately unfair to them in relation to those who make more. And the payroll tax, in point of fact, outrageously violates the principle of the ability to pay. These are contributory systems. They're not handouts to anybody. And their entitlements, sorry. Sorry, I don't buy that. I think we ought to start referring to them as they are. This is social insurance to which they have contributed substantially in the course of their working lives. And as we begin now to deal with this fiscal cliff or whatever it is, whose importance, by the way, in my judgment, is wildly exaggerated. I don't mean that not doing anything about it would be a good thing, but it shouldn't take much for the Congress of the United States in a bipartisan way to deal with it. Barry may want to talk about that later in the context of the kind of growing income inequality that we're experiencing in this country every day and every year. And I think one of the things that all of us, by the way, I'm wearing my Obama tie in honor of our guest of honor here. Wasn't Tuesday wonderful? Oh, oh. Katie just had a nice chat with Elizabeth Warren a few hours ago. One of the reasons she's hurting a little bit is because she was out knocking on doors in Quincy with that foolish thing on her leg and uh, persuading a few more people to vote. But I do think it's time we got this word out of our lexicon, frankly, because I think it's highly inaccurate, it's distorting, and it doesn't accurately describe what Medicare and Social Security are designed to do, and in point of fact, do. Now, there have been some people who have suggested, as you know, we're, we've raised the retirement age gradually, a few years. I don't have a problem with that as life expectancy grows. And uh, believe me, Social Security isn't bankrupt. Uh, it's not going to be bankrupt. Uh, a few modest changes in Social Security will guarantee the health of the program for the next 50 to 75 years. Uh, and even in the case of Medicare, where we do have some serious fiscal problems, although the fiscal integrity, integrity of the Medicare system has been substantially strengthened by the Affordable Care Act. Something to bear in mind. Repealing the Affordable Care Act would have brought us right up against serious medical, Medicare financial problems within a year or two or three, but it's not the case, thanks to the Affordable Care Act. But it's not just a matter of equity, folks. These two very important programs serve as part of the floor under our economy. Built-in stabilizers, the economists call them which ensures that even in the case of recession, we don't drop right through the floor. And they're very important in that respect. So uh, on the occasion of the retirement of our dear friend, who's done such great work, and by the way, my hat's off to you in connection with Cuba. Um, I think after 53 years, or whatever it is, we may just see a change in American policy on Cuba. Of course, it's been hugely successful, as all of us know. It's brought down Castro, right? <laughs> if you want democracy in Cuba, send 10,000 American business people over. They're going to have them climb all over the island pretty soon and, and lift the travel restrictions and send us all down there. It's wonderful. It's terrific. Of course, they need some help. Five buildings a week are collapsing in Havana every week. But uh, if ever there was a failed policy, that's it. I see a ray of hope, Dimitri. 50% of the Cuban Americans who voted in Florida voted for Obama. So, there may be a change in policy. But uh, I think it's time all of us stood up and proudly endorse the concept of social, social insurance for the chronically disabled and for people 65 and older. And by the way, notwithstanding 
some Democrats that are talking this way, the last thing in the world we ought to do is raise the eligibility age for Medicare. You're 65 or 66 or 67. Go out there and try to find yourself health insurance. You won't get it from the insurance companies. Oh, they may give it to you, you know, $25,000 a year. I'm serious. They don't want to insure people at 65, 66. Best thing that ever happened to the insurance companies was Medicare, because they don't have to insure these folks. Do you imagine what your premiums would look like if the insurance companies were required to insure people 65 and older? That burden has been lifted off their backs, thereby significantly reducing premiums to the rest of us because this government finance insurance system picks up that burden. So the next time you hear Congressman Cantor or anyone else talk about how the bottom line to resolving this fiscal situation has got to be entitlement reform, we know what that means, folks. Less Social Security, less health care, and enormous economic problems that apparently Congressman Cantor doesn't know about or didn't learn in basic economics at wherever he went to undergraduate school. Um, I'm not going to go on at any greater length because um, there are some very good people that we want to listen to, but I just find myself increasingly getting more and more annoyed at this stuff because um, these programs are the bedrock of this country and of our economic system as well as our social system. And it isn't a handout. It's not something that we're giving to people because we want to give them charity. They've paid in, paid in over an extended period of time, as I say, under a very unfair taxing system. And uh, I hope we can get rid of that word. Call it social insurance, call it whatever you want to call it. But let's, let's have enough of this, uh, you know, these people think they're entitled. That's the whole point of this. I don't know who came up with this. Uh, this um, probably the same guy that came up with uh, pre-owned cars. Remember we used to call them used cars? <laughs> same kind of thing. Or uh, consumer-driven health care. That's the one where you get a $10,000 deductible. You know, you get a buffalo policy, right? Covers you, but only if you're hit by a buffalo on Main Street at noon time. Otherwise, no cover. Um, and I hope as we go into this important, but by no means uh, critical period here, because it will be resolved one way or the other. And I hope and expect that the President's going to stand firm. He's gotten a mandate on this one, folks. I don't think there's any question about it. I hope we can stop talking about entitlements, start talking about social insurance, start talking about the importance of these commitments, not just for the people who benefit from them, but from this country's overall health. My hat's off to you, my friend. Um, Greeks, you know, are very tight. Um, we, we were getting increasingly annoyed with the Republican candidate for the presidency because he kept suggesting that if we didn't do things, we'd be like Greece over and over again. Well, um, Greece has sinned, no question about it. But as Barry will tell you, um, nobody's ever gotten out of a recession with austerity. It doesn't work. It doesn't work. And uh, if you want to know what the alternative is to what I hope will be a robust effort at investing in the expansion of this country's economy, just take a look at what the EU is doing to Southern Europe, and you'll get a pretty good sense of the value of austerity. In any event, I assume you're not retiring, really. <laughs> we expect a lot of good work from you. And who knows, maybe we'll all go down to Cuba one of these days and see if we can't be helpful down there under circumstances where um, Americans will be free to travel wherever they want to travel and uh, help the Cuban people to emerge from this very difficult half century and uh, combine democracy and healthy economic growth at the same time. Thanks for having me.
All right, thank you very much, Governor Dukakis, for being here today, number one, and for sharing your insights and wisdom about what I think would be distributive justice. Now, that's a term I learned from Professor Iatridi, so. Um, I, I do think that uh, you have much to offer and you should contemplate running for office someday. <laughs> we have a, a very distinguished panel to respond to Governor Dukakis's remarks, and I'll introduce them briefly to you. I want to reiterate, it will be brief, because when I got their bios, we'd be here a long time if I was going over their individual accomplishments. I'll begin with Reverend June Cooper, who before she was Reverend June Cooper, she was both a graduate of our school and a very popular and respected adjunct faculty member who taught our cross-cultural course for several years. A graduate of the Master of Divinity program at Andover Newton Theological School and an ordained Baptist minister, June works to more fully integrate the principles of faith-based organizations with those that inform the system of community-based human services. She currently serves as the executive director of the City Mission Society of Boston, the oldest multi-service social, social justice agency in New England, founded in 1816. Prior to this, Reverend Cooper served as regional administrator in the Boston Metropolitan Area Office of the Massachusetts Society for the Prevention of Cruelty to Children, as program director of the Boston Healthy Start Initiative, as program director uh, for the Medical Foundation Incorporated. Through these and similar positions, June has developed special expertise in facilitating private-public collaborations, designing and managing community-based programs, and linking community-based social service providers with grassroots community groups. So welcome back, June. <clears throat> Dr. Barry Bluestone. Dr. Barry Bluestone is the Russell B. and Andre B. Stearns Trustee Professor of Political Economy at Northeastern University. He's also the founding director of the Dukakis Center for Urban and Regional Policy and the founding dean of the School of Public Policy and Urban Affairs at Northeastern University. Before assuming these posts, Dr. Bluestone spent 12 years at the University of Massachusetts, Boston as the Frank L. Boyden Professor of Political Economy and as a senior fellow at the university's John W. McCormick Institute of Public Affairs. He was the founding director of UMass Boston's PhD program in public policy. Prior to that, he taught economics at Boston College for 16 years and was director of the university's Social Welfare Research Institute. At the Dukakis Center, Professor Bluestone has led research projects on housing, local economic development, state and local public finance, and the manufacturing sector of Massachusetts. As a political economist, he has written widely in the areas of income distribution, business and industrial policy, labor management relations, higher education finance, and urban and regional economic development. Welcome, Dr. Bluestone. And now for our esteemed Professor Iatridis. Professor Iatridis has held positions of leadership throughout his entire professional career beginning as an Associate Director of the Child Studies Center of Philadelphia, then Director of Social Planning for Doxiatis Associates in Athens, Greece, Director of the Graduate School of Achistics in Athens, Director of the Institute of Human Science at Boston College, a position he assumed in 1966 when he began at Boston College, and Director of the Social Welfare Regional Institute of the U.S. Department of Health and Educational Welfare. He has planned and secured government funding from Hungary, Poland, Greece, and Georgia for international conferences on the transition from central planning to free markets of Eastern and Central Europe. He has provided workshops for health and welfare executives through the Greek Ministry of Health. He has been an active presenter for years at the Hellenic Conference of Health Policy and Administration. He has been a prolific author of scholarly articles and books, including his books on social justice and the welfare state in Central Eastern Europe privatization in Central and Eastern Europe, social policy, institutional context of social development, social organizations, social policy for development, social policy for development, health and welfare organizations. And if you're one of his students, you read all those books. <laughs> he has been a visiting lecturer and scholar at universities in Greece, the United Kingdom, Canada, and Switzerland. He was appointed to the Education Committee of the 2004 Olympics in Athens. His service to the Graduate School of Social Work and the University has been legendary, serving on all of the major school committees over the past years, including Academic Planning Committee, International Committee, Promotion and Tenure Committee, and so forth. 
For the university, he has chaired the University uh, Grievance Committee and has been, I believe, the longest serving member of the Faculty Compensation Committee. He has chaired the school's community organization planning policy and administration sequence and was the first to establish a series of international courses that included comparative policy analysis and travel with students and colleagues to China, Russia, Greece, and Cuba, a trip he has made 29 times. So, it is clear that Professor Iatridis is a renowned international scholar whose career has been dedicated to social justice for the most disadvantaged, making him a model social worker and for our students and for the entire profession of social work. So I will now turn the floor over to our distinguished panelists, ask them to uh, take seats up here. We'll begin with uh, Reverend Cooper and Professor Bluestone, and then we'll give the last word to Professor Iatridis. Good afternoon, everyone. Well, I'm a Baptist preacher, and there's no clock in the back of the room. <laughs> so you know what that means. We're in trouble. But um, needless to say, this isn't the occasion to preach, but is this, this is the occasion to celebrate a life and a, and a um, commitment to the work that I so dearly uh, love and cherish. And to be back here at uh, Boston College is always um, great. It's always a challenge to find out where I'm going to park. <laughs> so, um, speak about entitlements. <laughs> I need a handicap sticker. What um, I want to say first um, to Governor Dukakis, uh, we need to have a private conversation because I want to thank this man. He came to see a little program that I was running back in 1976 over at Dimmick Community Health Center and was my first uh, job, was in the, I think it was in the 80s, excuse me. He came and my back was against the wall because the funding was falling apart. And he was visiting the health center and he took a special uh, little detour over to where um, the, the training center that I was running. So I want to thank you for that. And uh, that program was very successful and went on and did very great things. Um, so I thank you for that. I want to speak uh, just briefly about some of the challenges that uh, we face on the ground. We're here, obviously, um, Professor Iatridis has always spoke and has always been a champion for, for not just doing charity, which we love to do at the church, give a new coat, or to uh, put new shoes on someone, and we will always need those things. But the challenge is really, how do we go upstream? So how do we, we get the babies, we get the children as they come down the stream, but how do we go upstream and begin to change some of the systems and some of the policies that really do not work well for, um, for children, for women, for, seniors, um, and the like. So my work at City Mission has been very much informed and I've been privileged to uh, be able to, to work with the board and, and congregations throughout the metropolitan area to try to put in place some programs and some responses to um, the fact that many people, as Governor Dukakis said, there's no floor to stand on. Many people do not have a floor to stand on. So one of the efforts that we started early on at City Mission was an, an, a program, switched it from a charity model where people could come to the door and knock on the door and get their rent, rental assistance, get a lot of things done. But we switched that program over to looking at the issue of homelessness prevention. There are a lot of, a lot of initiatives to try to stem and to work with people that are homeless. But again, the idea is to go upstream. It's so hard to climb out of poverty when you're falling into it. So some of our work right now is informed by this notion of let us try to prevent some of the issues and let's give people tools and let's give people 
and empower people and work to, with them to be empowered to try to go upstream and to negotiate systems and to be aware of what's really going on and looking at the whole issues of around systemic oppression. The other piece that we work on now at City Mission is Superintendent Johnson has a program in the Boston Public School called the Circle of Promise. And it includes about 47 schools that are failing terribly. Uh, just name the indicator of uh, child success. Um, and the superintendent has asked faith communities to get involved, not just Christian faith communities, but the Muslim communities and the Jewish communities to get involved and to get connected to a school. And it is so interesting as we look at the numbers now, um, as I was saying yesterday, many of the kids at the school that we're in, the Russell School in Dorchester, 95% of those kids are growing up in poverty. And if we know anything about poverty and achievement, we know that less than half of those kids will walk across the stage and receive a diploma. Now there are about 360 kids in that school. So do the math. And the big question is what are we missing out on when we are not um, supporting and being behind our children? Another uh, interesting number that is rising up uh, as we look at uh, the achievement gap is that the numbers around the economics seem to trump the issues of race. So that we, we're talking mostly about uh, poor kids and certainly race is a factor that is also a very dominant with that. Last uh, but not least, I wanna talk about an effort that we are doing to try to uh, bring um, people into the city. I think many of us might know that we live in two different worlds, right? We live in a, there are suburban communities and then there are urban communities. And one of the efforts that we started about five years ago was a service learning uh, program that brings young people into the city of Boston, not just to clean a wall or to scrub a toilet, to do these kinds of things, but to really, to, to challenge their stereotypes, to begin to break down, about, uh, um, break down the stereotypes that people have. You know, when we read the newspaper and we read the statistics, we don't oftentimes know that there's a face, that there's a life, that there's a human being behind those numbers. So this program uh, exposes young people. And we're starting to see that not only is it that we need to have suburban people exposed, we need to have kids in the inner city exposed as well. So that's a wonderful effort that is opening people's eyes to seeing more than uh, just reading the paper, but seeing that there are real people, when we talk about issues of poverty and discrimination and racism, that there are real people impacted by that. And lastly, when you don't have a floor, if you don't have a floor, you at least need a voice. And one of the wonderful things that uh, is happening now is that City Mission has a program called Public Voice, which worked really uh, hard uh, before uh, the Cory, with Cory reform issues uh, about five years ago. And basically this is a program that provides people with skills to begin up, to get up and to tell their story. You know, we don't look like, everybody has a story and sometimes they don't look like their story. And when you hear people's stories, again, it's another way to begin to look beyond what we believe and what we think about people. Our Christian narrative is I talk a lot and I would um, say that the faith narrative talks a lot about uh, being in community. It doesn't speak, at least in, in my tradition, about being a rugged individual and going it alone. It speaks to the common good. It speaks to the fact that we as people are all bound uh, by a, um, an invisible force that pulls us together as human beings. And so with that narrative, I think that it is very important as um, these issues get talked about and debated and uh, scrutinized that at the end of the day that we remember who we are and to whom we uh, belong. 
Now, uh, to you, Professor Iotrides, there was somebody many years ago by a pawn in Concord who said something like this, canaries do not sing in a cage. <laughs> so I think that you have taught so many people to sing, to sing and to come out of the cage. And certainly I use that a lot when I talk about the issues that I deal with, issues of justice, issues of equality, um, issues of having a voice to speak. So you have empowered so many people to find their voice and then to use their voice to make change. So I just want to leave you with those words and to thank you very much. Well, this is a very, very, very special occasion for me, maybe just as special as is for my dear friend Demetrius. In the fall of 1971, at the ripe old age of 27, I arrived on this campus as a new assistant professor of economics. Um, but I was very fortunate as an economist uh, because my office was not in Kearney Hall, which you may remember. I don't think Kearney Hall even exists anymore, right? Still does. Still does. Unfortunately. For, unfortunately. <laughs> But I, my office, because I was with the Social Welfare Research Institute, was in McGuinn Hall, which is where Demetrius's office and the School of Social Work was located. And so my rather stringent economics training was leavened by people who actually were concerned about real people. And mm -hmm. I think it had a tremendous impact on me, as did Dimitri himself. In fact, I was thinking as I was preparing for coming over here, that I think Dimitri was possibly the second or third person I met on campus on that very first week I was here. And he welcomed me here and I'm thrilled that we've been friends now for 41 years. I also have to tell you how exciting it is to be back on campus because while I've taught, as you heard, the University of Massachusetts and I'm now at Northeastern with my dear friend and colleague Mike Dukakis and Kitty, I still have a very warm place in my heart for this wonderful place. I came here when mm. C.V. Joyce was president. Yeah, that's right. A couple of years later, of course, Father Monin came, Frank Campanella was here. And I have to say, of all the places I've taught, and of all the places I've lectured in across the country and around the world, there is no place that I think is warmer and more humane than Boston mm. College. And it's because of that history of people like them and Demetrius. Uh, that made those 16 years I spent here so wonderfully. I also have to tell you one little, little story. Governor Dukakis and I have taught together for many years, and one of the things we teach is called the open classroom. And the open classroom is a real graduate seminar. I have real students writing term papers, taking exams, but the lectures are open to the public. Anyone can come. And this year, this semester, we're doing policy advice to the president. And we've had an array of truly amazing individuals as guest speakers. We began with economics with Larry Summers and Greg Mankiw. Greg is the uh, chair of the Harvard Economics Department and uh, I guess continues to be an economic advisor to Mr. Romney. Uh, we had a number of people on health care. We had Eric Rosengren, the president and CEO of the Boston Fed. But just a couple weeks ago, we turned to foreign policy and uh, Mike invited uh, Ambassador Nick Burns, Nicholas Burns, who now teaches at Harvard. And he is one of the most distinguished diplomats mm -hmm. in the history of this country. Mm -hmm. I think he was ambassador to Greece, he was ambassador to the United Nations, he served with Condoleezza Rice, he helped formulate our policies in Iran, Afghanistan, and many places. And when he arrived in the lecture hall with 300 people there, I walked down to the front and I stuck out my hand and I said, Mr. Ambassador, it is mm -hmm. such an absolute honor to have you here at Northeastern University. And I must tell you, it is a personal honor to finally meet you. I've been a great fan of everything you've done over these many years. I followed you in terms of your career. I follow your uh, op-ed in the Globe every week. So it's just wonderful to finally meet you. And the ambassador turned to me and says, well, actually, Barry, we've met before. <laughs> but oh my God, I cannot remember ever meeting this guy. And then he says, I was a student in your undergraduate political economy course oh, wow. in 1978. Mm. And I felt amazingly proud 
and older than Demetrius. <laughs> Yeah, he's a graduate of. He's a graduate yeah. of Boston College and one of mm. our wonderful graduates. In fact, we are going with the former Dean of Arts and Sciences, Joe Quinn, from Boston College, to the BC basketball game on December 4th with Nick and his wife. Terrific. Yes. <laughs> We're great fans still. But I just wanted to say briefly about um, how an economist looks at these issues. And actually, it takes me back to a, a wonderful moment. You now own it. But before you owned it, Boston College, mm. The Archdiocese of Boston had their headquarters right here, in fact, the home for Bernard Cardinal Law. And when I had first arrived, just arrived at Northeastern University to begin the development of the Center for Urban and Regional Policy, which in 2008 became the Kitty and Michael Dukakis Center for Urban and Regional Policy, I got a call from the Cardinal's secretary and simultaneously from the uh, president of the Greater Boston Chamber of Commerce, Paul Guzzi. And I was invited by both of them to come over to the Cardinal's residence to talk about the crisis in affordable housing. Mm -hmm. Housing prices had been going up at double digit rates. And so I went there and the Cardinal was in his wonderful attire and Paul Guzzi was in a three piece striped suit. And we mm -hmm. talked about affordable housing and in the course of that conversation, I remember the Cardinal saying to me, Barry, we need you to study housing because it is a moral obligation, a moral obligation that we have decent housing for all our people. Mm. And I remember looking over at uh, the president of the Greater Boston Chamber of Commerce, a dear friend of mine, Paul Guzzi, and Paul saying, it may be a moral obligation, but I know it's an economic necessity. Mm -hmm. If we do not provide housing that's affordable, we won't be able to retain young people in the Commonwealth, and we're gonna have a trouble fulfilling all the jobs we wanna create. Moral obligation, economic necessity. Well, given that we're now facing the fiscal cliff that Governor Dukakis mentioned, I did a piece which I hope may show up in the New York Times, I've sent it off to the op-ed, in which I thought about what should we do in terms of dealing with the dual problem of slow economic growth and major deficits in federal debt. We have two problems. Mm. And how do we do it in a way that both fulfills our moral obligation but also solves an economic necessity? So I went back to the data and I said, let's take a look at where income has flowed over the last five years. And it turns out that 87% of all the net increase in income over the last five years, 87% has gone to the richest 10% of all Americans. And I have no problem with that, in a way. In a way. Yeah. In a way. 87% <laughs> go to the top 10%. This is a period of time which we've also had very sluggish growth, and I was trying to figure out, now, mm. why, with this income growth, would growth be so slow? And I started thinking about what do we need right now more than anything else? What we need is not more savings. We've got tons of savings. We got two trillion dollars sitting around in the coffers of major corporations waiting to be invested once they think they can produce something that will be sold. Savings is not the problem. The real problem is spending. We simply don't have enough spending. We need more spending by people. So what I have suggested is Let's take a look at who spends money and who saves. Well, rich people save. In fact, if you look at the top 1% of all American families, they save about 51 cents out of every additional dollar they receive. They spend 49 cents out of every dollar. On the other hand, if you look at the poorest one-fifth of the population, those are low-income families, they spend mm. virtually 100%, 99.6% of every dollar is spent. And if you look at the second and third quintile, including middle America, all of them spend more than 90% of additional dollars. So think of it this way. If you took $1,000 and you taxed a rich person at the 1% level, and you taxed another $1,000 from them, and then you transferred it to, let's say, the first three quintiles in the form of a tax rebate, you would give up about 
$490 worth of spending on the part of the rich family, but you gain $990 worth of spending of the first three, with a net increase of $500 going into the spending stream. Note for Republicans, we're not putting one more dollar into government spending. We're letting people spend their money. So I argue, not for raising taxes back to 38.6% from 35, but that we should have a temporary increase of marginal tax rates, particularly on the top 10%, of 50%, which would get us back to the horrendous tax rates of the very liberal president, Ronald Reagan, and hold it there until the unemployment rate is under 6%, and then lower it again. And that is the kind of thing we want to do because it is the morally right thing to do. So we take some of that 87% of that, that income that went to the top 1% and redistribute it without really doing much harm to the wealthy, but put it precisely in the hands of people who need it desperately, will spend it, and thus move us toward the full employment we need in the process, probably making the rich even richer. Well, it's wonderful to be back here at Boston College. And it's especially wonderful to be here with my Greek friends, Dimitri and Michael. You know what they say about being last in a panel or speaking and so on, <laughs> that uh, the other said everything, there is nothing left for you to say. And when you deal with uh, uh, Max Dukakis and these distinguished uh, uh, members of the panel, uh, this is even more uh, so uh, true. <laughs> so uh, it, it's a very difficult. On the other hand, it gives you the opportunity to say a few things about what the others said, and they don't have a chance to answer you. <laughs> so it's, uh, it's very easy. Uh, starting with Mike uh, and his uh, problem with entitlement, uh, I said it in many respects, and uh, I have no particular uh, vested interest in that, except for one thing, that entitlement was meant, I think, to be, at least that's what I explained to my students, that this is not charity, that we're talking about something that people are entitled to as human beings, not charity, not philanthropy. And in that sense, I'm not worrying too much about the entitlement, although I don't like the uh, term uh, uh, either. The, uh, going to my friend Barry uh, about spending, of course, uh, uh, economists should uh, support spending. What else? I mean, uh, <laughs> what else is left? But let me give you just one statistic that uh, came to mind while you were talking. I saw the other day that uh, uh, Americans spend $8 billion in cos cosmetics. This is $2 billion more that you need to provide basic education for everyone in the world. So spending, yes, but spending where is, I think, the hard core of social policy. And this is the challenge for poverty. We all want to do something about it. We have to spend some money. There's no magic to do anything without spending money. But the problem is how you spend this money, who is spending the money, what priority we have. And uh, uh, this is uh, the question that I wanted to raise with you today, tonight. Uh, we know a lot about poverty. Uh, some of it is exaggerated. Some of it uh, uh, is not. For example, uh, strictly under the poverty line in the United States, we have 46 million people right now in poverty. This is uh, more, uh, this is as high, I would say, as uh, when uh, President Johnson declared the war against poverty. So all these years, since the 60s, the only thing we were able to do is to stay, uh, to have as much poverty as we had at the time, and social exclusion as well. So what have we done for, for all this time? Are we going to continue doing the same thing? Where is it going to get us? We have two choices, really. Either 
to assume uh, business as usual mm -hmm. and accept what's happening as something rather natural. And if you're very conservative, you may even claim that it is desirable and unavoidable to have poverty, which of course is not true. But this is what we will all do if we accept business as usual. And business as usual means that not only we're not going to do anything about the moral crisis that we have today, and I agree with the, the point you made and with the comments that you made, June, that it is a moral crisis. It's not a matter of bad behavior, a few bad people who just didn't make it because of, of a f because of the fault being their own. It's social crisis, uh, which means that there is something systemic that makes these people unable uh, to uh, make it. So it's 46 million uh, people officially under poverty. But most of the studies indicate that in essence, the people that are in poverty, the new poor and the almost poor, which are usually ignored, are 150 million people, Americans, today unable to make it. Mm. There is one study that impressed me. I'm not so sure that I subscribe to the way the study reasons the facts. But anyway, the study says that by the year 2050, we're going to have 900 million poor added to the present one. So the option to do nothing, uh, business as usual, is not only going to do absolutely nothing to deal with the present crisis, but is going to do nothing for what is coming ahead. Uh, all uh, the, the panelists and, and the governor alluded to the critical fiscal problem that we're facing. Sure, uh, we're going to have more deficit than we have now, at least for the next 10 or so years. Economists don't want to predict things more than seven years, rightly so, but uh, if you do project it to 10 or 15 years, our uh, income and the high interest we pay, we are not going to have money, the federal government, the state governments are not going to have money enough for the either entitlement programs or the minimum social security mm. programs or social insurance programs. And that will perpetuate. The, uh, I don't believe we're going to have 900 million Americans more in poverty by the year 2050. I think we will be doing a number of other things that will be much more effective than what we have been uh, doing since President Johnson. But we have another alternative, another option, which is to commit ourselves, and I mean ourselves individually even, at this point, that we're going to go away from here tonight with a commitment that we're going to be doing something about this situation which is unacceptable morally, ethically, from the social justice viewpoint, from human rights viewpoint. And the question that I have is, what, what do I tell my students that they have to do individually? What kind of framework we can use? There are many many proposals uh, how to fight poverty and how to eliminate poverty. Uh, some of them are excellent work. Some of them might not be that excellent. But how do we choose the one that will be really effective? And this is what concerns me. And I start with an individual commitment that we must all have that we have to make a difference. We have to be able to contribute to the solution. Without this commitment, I don't think we will provide the leadership for, the, uh, for what has to be done, which is a mass movement. Not necessarily the, the Occupy uh, Wall Street uh, movement, but that taught us a number of things uh, as well. Provided some leadership, brought the uh, point uh, that was made before about the 1% really having all the power and controlling the, the rest 90, 99%. And that is not going to be acceptable in the future, at least for as long as we have a value system 
that uh, uh, we have in this country. So the fiscal problem will increase, poverty will increase, human uh, misery will increase. Parenthetically, uh, I want to remind you the famous NIMH uh, uh, study on the effect of 1% increase in unemployment on uh, human behavior. You all know it. It's a long-range study. It's a wonderful study. But for every 1% unemployment, we increase 5% admissions to mental hospitals. Mm. We increase suicide. We increase uh, 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 the, uh, the, uh, the crime element. Mm -hmm. And you all know that the Federal Reserve traditionally prefers to, uh, to have uh, more unemployment than inflation. Inflation hits or might hit the l higher income groups much harder than uh, unemployment uh, they figure uh, that hits more the poor. So if our Federal Reserve policy is to increase as a matter of public policy unemployment, you consider the 1% increase what kind of money we have to pay both in human misery and uh, also for treating people that have been suffering not because of any fault of their own. Okay, I started by saying that what do we do? The, the pleasant commitment. We have to provide the leadership because the poor don't have uh, the kind of thing that the 1% has, namely a legion of uh, lobbyists or power to make uh, their case in Washington at all. So we need to provide the leadership for a change in the way we talk about poverty, we think about poverty and social exclusion. In addition to that, I picked up one of the recommendations that were made uh, in the literature, there are many, but I thought that that one is very appropriate uh, since uh, we had uh, an election uh, and uh, we have uh, re-elected Obama. And that is that I would like to see from the bottoms up a petition, a pressure by all of us, by more of, of us, to the President of the United States for uh, including in his in January State of the Union uh, next uh, uh, year uh, a calling of uh, a White, White House conference mm -hmm. on the eradication of poverty and uh, 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 social exclusion. We need high priority in order to be able to help the poor, not the priority that we have now. A White uh, uh, House conference can provide the President with a concrete report, a new report, a new approach, a manifesto of how to eradicate poverty. They can call in the White House the best of the best. And it doesn't have to be prolonged for years. It can be done because we have these resources, we have the knowledge, we have the experience to eradicate poverty and social exclusion if we really may uh, uh, follow a different strategy and a different approach that uh, I, I recommend we do. But the bottom-down approach is not enough. Parallel to that, we need to have a bottom-up approach. We can have uh, town hall meetings, conferences, uh, uh, local government, state government, exactly doing the same thing. How are we going to implement a manifesto of eradicating poverty and social inclusion. And unless we involve our own neighborhoods, our own organizations, we're not very likely to be more successful. We ought to mobilize not only individuals, family and groups, but neighborhoods and states and the national government. We need to mobilize all organizations. Since we are in a university, I would suggest that universities can play a much more effective role 
about eradicating poverty and social exclusion than now. All universities, including Boston College, has a tremendous number of centers and institutes. They are all wonderful, and they are doing a tremendous job, and we need them. But there isn't a single one on poverty or social exclusion that really does the research that is needed and organizes communities and people in order to bring the change that we need. Uh, particularly being in the School of Social Work, I would hope eventually the School of Social Work will establish a center for poverty and social exclusion and reach out in the community to provide the leadership that is needed for a mass uh, movement. I uh, uh, think that if we have the imagination and the courage, we have the knowledge and the means uh, to succeed. Thank you.